um, I'm going to be talking about the technologies that we use for engraftment monitoring. But I'd like to start by saying that the technologies that we do use for engraftment monitoring are actually um, <coughs> a segue from what has traditionally used, uh, been used in forensic medicine for human identity testing. And uh, as you can imagine, there are a lot of indications for human identity testing, and I've listed a few of them um, in, this, in this particular slide. The first and the most obvious one that comes to mind, of course, is forensics cases, where you're trying to match a suspect with, uh, with evidence at the scene of the crime. And it used to be that it had to be human biological evidence until a few years ago, when even plant-based evidence or, or animal-based evidence can now be used um, in, in testing and matching a suspect with evidence at the scene of a crime. Um, there's also parental testing, and although for the majority of the time it's used for, for fathers, mothers can also be tested for occasionally when there's mix-ups in hospitals, surrogate mothers, um, adoption cases where people are trying to find their birth parents, um, historical investigations. One example would be uh, Holocaust victims that have been buried in mass graves, um, where relatives <laughs> are now trying to identify um, the individuals that have been buried in, 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 mass gra in, in various graves in Europe that are unmarked. Uh, there's missing persons investigations. Um, this is usually in the case of kidnappings of children, where once the children grow up and they start looking for their birth parents, there's, this is, this is um, the testing that's performed now to try and reunite families. Um, mass disasters, one example would be 9-11, where about 3,000 people perished. Uh, but there's 20,000 pieces of human remains uh, at the scene, and so not only is there an attempt made to identify these re human remains, but also uh, an attempt to actually put the pieces back together. Uh, in terms of the military, it used to be that the dog tag was all they had to identify a soldier who had perished in battle, and you can imagine how accurate that could be. So now, any, everybody who enlists actually in the armed forces has to provide a sample of blood, and this is stored for future use, if and when one needs to use it. Uh, and then you have the convicted felon DNA database, which is uh, somewhat controversial. Um, it used to be up until about 2004 that only individuals that were convicted of extremely serious crimes, uh, violent crimes, were, were compelled to provide DNA for this database, and profiles were maintained in the databases. Um, Post-2004, everyone who's convicted of a crime has a sample collected and um, profile and actually placed on this database and it's available to all law enforcement agencies and I think in I think a couple of years ago they even in, ex, they even opened it up to kinship DNA matching which is even more controversial uh, but we won't go into that now uh, so when it comes to human identity testing in DNA in HLA labs uh, what we do is a little more prosaic than what I just described to you though no less important I believe um, it's routinely used for engraftment monitoring after a human stem cell transplantation. Um, and the basic uh, course of events is that the pre-transplant DNA from the recipient and the do and donor DNA is collected and profiled. And then post-transplant specimens are compared to this profile in order to determine if there's a mix or if there's entirely 100% donor or 100% recipient uh, in a post-transplant sample. In addition to this, uh, HLA labs also perform additional human identity testing. Uh, although the majority of our human identity testing falls into the post-transplant scenario. Um, we perform parentage testing, but that's a subset of HLA labs. Uh, we also look for uh, maternal cells, maternally derived cells in patients that um, are referred to us uh, on suspicion of being uh, skits patients. Uh, and finally, no, though this doesn't happen very often, we'll occasionally get uh, donors that uh, report that they are identical twins, and we verify that they are indeed identical twins to the potential to the to the to the recipient. Uh, so, in terms of the methodologies, there has been a whole series of methods that have been used, starting from the 80s. Um, the earliest of which was RFLP, which has <coughs> now fallen into disuse, at least in HLA labs. Um, and I'll, I'll discuss this somewhat briefly. VNTR I won't discuss at all except to tell you that STR, which is what I'm going to be discussing at great length, and which is what we use currently in the lab, is a subset of VNTRs. Uh, VNTRs indicating VN variable nucleotide tandem repeats, and they can extend all the way from a single nucleotide repeat to 70 nucleotide repeats. 
short tandem repeats as a subset. They extend from single nucleotide to seven or eight nucleotides. And that's what we, we work with in the lab. And so that's what I'm going to be focusing on. And finally, I'll um, give you a little overview on this, on this new test that is uh, currently being developed by uh, Celera. Uh, it's, it's based on real-time PCR. Um, it's in beta testing right now, so it's not commercially available yet. Uh, but there are some places where it might actually be a very useful test to have. And so I'll go into a little bit of detail about that too. So uh, briefly to discuss restriction fragment length polymorphisms, which were, uh, which were first uh, introduced by Sir Jeffreys uh, in 1985, I think, and then was essentially the only DNA test in use for, for genomic DNA um, for at least until the mid-90s. And, and it's, it's, it's a crude assay. It's got a, few, it's got a few caveats associated with it. But at the time, it was state of the art. So essentially what it is, is genomic DNA collected from an individual. Uh, you use a specific restriction enzyme that cleaves this DNA to give you specific sized fragments that can be separated on a gel. And then you visualize these fragments using a probe or multiple probes. Um, the probes, of course, are complementary to a certain sequence of DNA within these fragments, and the probes tend to be labeled in some way, either fluorescently labeled or they could be uh, radioactively labeled. It was radioactively to begin with and then fluorescently later. Uh, this, as I said, has far, largely fallen into disuse. It's mainly used now for this, for this one test that I could actually find evidence for when I Googled it. And that's uh, looking for uh, sickle cell anemia. And so here you have, in this cartoon, we have a, a sickle cell anemia, as you all know, is um, a disease that's an autosomal recessive. So people can be carriers and be phenotypically normal. Uh, the difference between an individual who's completely normal and a person who carries a copy of the sickle cell disease gene is uh, the beta subunit of hemoglobin that's affected, really. It's a single amino acid difference between the wild type copy of the gene, which is the beta A, versus uh, the affected copy of the gene, which is beta S. Uh, and this single nucleotide difference, that's a T versus an A, results in an amino acid change. What it also does is that it changes the recognition sequence for a specific, specific restriction enzyme called MST2 which recognizes a seven nucleotide region. Embedded in this sequence is NAG, where N is any nucleotide, A and G. Um, this is recognized very easily in the wild type copy of the beta S, where, sorry, in the, in the wild type copy of the beta S, whereas GAG, whereas uh, this mutation of this A to a T in the affected gene um, basically abolishes this recognition sequence by MST2. So if you take a person's DNA, a chromosomal DNA, and just digest it with MST2, um, and then probe with the sequence, that, with the probe that recognizes the sequence in this region, uh, an affected individual should actually give you a long product, a higher molecular weight product, whereas a wild type copy of the gene should give you just a short product. So an individual who's completely wild type, two copies of the wild type gene, all you get is a short product. An individual who's a carrier, you get both versions, the short and the long. And an individual that only expresses the sickle cell uh, anemia gene, as you can see, you only get the long version. And as I said, this, this was essentially what we used 20 years ago to follow engraftment. Um, most of it, of course, as you can imagine, was eyeballing the gel to see what percentage we're looking at in terms of donor or recipient. Uh, here is another instance where it was used in a crime investigation. Uh, so what you have here is uh, chromosomal DNA from a victim that was cut with a restriction enzyme and then probed with a series of, of probes. Uh, there's some evidence that was collected. One was a semen stain on the victim's clothing. That was evidence one. Evidence two was a vaginal swab from the victim. And then there were two suspects in the case. You had suspect one, who's profiled here, and suspect two, who's profiled here. And this is just a normal control DNA to make sure that the enzyme has cut perfectly. And as you can see, enzyme, uh, the suspect two can be ruled out just based on this profile. In case of suspect one, chances are pretty high that he committed the crime. But since here we're looking at only six alleles, 
uh, you can see the probability that the crime was committed by this individual is 1 in 4,000. If you had 16 loci that you were looking at, it was 1 in 250 million. So the number of loci that you use to, to examine these uh, profiles uh, increases your power of uh, discrimination essentially. Uh, so that's as much as I'm going to discuss RFLP. Um, so to move on to a short tandem piece and the real-time PCR, to start with I'll, I'll discuss the STR uh, loci that we, that we use currently that are in common use in the lab. Uh, so what is an STR? It's the short tandem repeat locus. It's a, it's a genetic locus that's, that's found dispersed all over the chromosome. Uh, it's usually found in non-coding regions of the DNA. Uh, what's powerful about this is that you have a number of repeat units. And these repeat units can be, as I said, any number of repeats from a single nucleotide repeat all the way up to 70. Um, repeat units, but they're flanked by sequences that are absolutely conserved between the entire human population. So you could design primers that recognize these conserved regions that are flanking, and then instead of interrogating a single nucleotide polymorphism, which is what you do with the RFLP, what you're actually interrogating is size differences in the resultant PCR products. So you're looking at amplified fragment length polymorphisms. And there's, as I said, a myriad of uh, alleles represented in the human population, uh, making this a very powerful test in terms of discrimination. So this is a cartoon uh, depicting um, what the chromosomal DNA looks like with repeats. And here we're looking at a tetranucleotide repeat, AATG. This particular individual is a heterozygote. So he has two different alleles, eight repeats on one chromosome, seven, allele, seven uh, repeats on the other chromosome. The PCR primers are exactly the same because it's the same conserved sequence that's recognized. You have fluorescent dyes that are conjugated to one of the primers uh, that then allow the PCR products to, to be followed using laser detection. Uh, and this is the basic principle of the, of the assay. One could look for just chimerism in, in entire whole blood or whole marrow, or one could then examine different subsets for engraftment. Um, and all you would need really is a specific marker on the surface of the cell. So if you wanted to look at CD at T cells, you'd use CD3 or CD2. If you wanted to look at B cells, you'd look, look at CD19 positive cells. If you wanted to look at progenitors, you'd look at CD34. Um, your only limitation in terms of the cell type that you'd want to look at would be that it'd be adequately represented in whatever it is that you were examining, whether it was peripheral blood or a whole marrow, or, and that it should have a specific marker that you could use to pull it away from everything else. Uh, and the technologies that are used for separating these cell subsets from everything else in the blood and the bone marrow uh, are either a magnetic bead system, and there's two versions of it. One is semi-automated by Miltani, and there's a walkaway system manufactured by RoboCEP. Or you could, you could use flow cytometric cell sorting, which is what we currently use in the lab. Uh, and it's actually the HEMPAT lab that does the cell sorting for us. So this is just a karyotype, an individual's karyotype from the 23 different uh, chromosome pairs. And um, what I'm showing you here is the loci, the STR loci, that are interrogated by the, the two major commercial manufacturers of STR kits in the US one of which is Promega and the other one of which is ABI. Um, but below each set of chromosomes is, is the chromosome number. And then in, in red are the loci on each chromosome um, that is part of the kit. Now in red uh, are, the, are the loci that are common to both kits, both the ABI kit and the Promega kit. In green are uh, the loci that are specific to just the, the Promega kit and the blue are the ones that are specific just to the ABI kit. But as you can see, in general, over 90 or close to 90 percent of the loci are shared between the two kits. There's really not that much difference uh, between the two of them. There are 16 different loci that are interrogated and they are spread over 14 different chromosomes. And in terms of uh, the power of discrimination, this is, this is taken from the Promega website. And you can see, and they've looked, they've actually separated them out based on the racial group that they're looking at. And just based on these numbers, you can tell that your chances of finding an individual within your racial group 
who is matched with you at all 16 loci is close to impossible on this planet. Mm. There is no way. So, but, and, but this is very powerful for us, especially when you have multiple donors and recipients and you're trying to look for, for um, alleles that are informative. Uh, you need this, this breadth of, of uh, power of discrimination. So this is what a, a typical profile would look like for an individual. This is a chromatogram of process data. This is a multiplex reaction. All 16 <laughs> sets of PCR primers are within, a single, are, are within a single tube. You add your chromosomal DNA. You set up your PCR reaction. Following that, you then run the products on, um, on a gel. And you have laser detection of, of the products, um, which can detect the fluorescein dye that's conjugated to the, to the PCR products because of the primers that are conjugated to these dyes, Joe, which is a, a, a conjugate of fluorescein or TMR, which is, which is a derivative of rhodamine. Um, so this is, as if you just look at this individual, you can tell that at all of these loci, this individual is a heterozygote. Below, below each peak, it indicates what allele this individual encodes at these loci. Um, there's some loci at which this individual is a homozygote, as you can see, and this locus as well as this one and this one. But over the majority, he, is a, he or she is a heterozygote. And this is, this is a typical profile for an individual with no mixes. But if you were actually looking at a, at a, a recipient's sample post-transplant, here we are looking at a CD3 subset, about a year post-transplant for a patient. You have the recipient's profile, and here we've only depicted five different loci that we're looking at, <coughs> which are the ones that are conjugated to fluorescein. Uh, you have the donor's profile, and if you just look at this, you can tell immediately which loci are unique to the patient and which loci are unique to the donor. You want to avoid loci that are common, of course, because they're completely non-informative. You also want loci which are bidirectionally informative, so not just informative in one direction as far as possible. So if you look at this, you can see that D21S, lo the D21S locus is informative. Although they do share an allele, they also have one allele that's bidirectionally informative. And this tells you that the, this is the donor's peak and with, a, with the red arrow pointing to it. And that's the recipient peak. And just by estimating um, the, the area under the, under the peak, you can determine what the percentage of the particular donor-recipient uh, mix was. Um, the next locus is also informative giving us both a recipient and a donor-specific peak. And finally, Penta-E, which is the next one over, is also informative, giving us a donor-specific peak as well as a recipient-specific peak. And this is one of, and this, this allowed us to estimate that it's about 75% donor in this uh, CD3 subset from peripheral blood. So this is taken from a paper by Frederick Barron et al., which came out in Current Opinions in Hematology. And this is to depict to you, um, this is following stem cell transplantation patients that uh, received non-myeloblative conditioning. And they looked at various different subsets of peripheral blood, essentially. Um, and there are 108 patients, and you're looking at medium percent donor chimerism. As you can see, the myeloid lineage engrafts very, very rapidly. Within a month, you are getting above 95 percent engraftment in the monocytic and the granulocytic lineages. The T cells and the NK cells are a lot slower in terms of engraftment, at least in this, uh, in this setup where you have non-myeloablative conditioning. Uh, the story is somewhat different when you have myeloablative conditioning regimens. Uh, but by six months, sorry, this was six months and this is year. So the, the time frame we're looking at is a month, month and a half, two, two and a half months, three, six, and a year. But within, within six months, everybody's engrafted. This, the whole group of them has, in, has engrafted about 100%. Um, this is a single CML patient. And what, what was done here is we followed engraftment, of course, in the T-cell lineage for this patient. Uh, meanwhile, uh, the, the molecular diagnostics lab also looks at BCR able in this patient, which is their, their molecular marker for the disease. As you can see, as T cell engraftment proceeds, uh, the BCR able signature starts to decrease. So that uh, by the time 100% engraftment is attained, uh, there's very little BCR able detected in this patient. Uh, this is this is taken from the same paper where they looked at uh, 
T-cell and NK-cell chimerism in patients at day 14. Each X represents a single patient. As you can see just by looking at it, at the graph, um, the percent of donor cells is a higher median in terms of uh, in individuals that engrafted, which are the ones on the left in both halves of the graph, versus the ones that did not engraft or rejected. And although this is not absolute, as you can see, because there are individuals uh, who had very little T cell engraftment at day 14 and very little NK cell engraftment, but then went on to engraft perfectly up to a year post transplant. And then there are individuals that do have pretty high engraftment um, at day 14 who then subsequently lost their grafts. So as I said, it's not absolute, but it does make the physicians more comfortable when they see a higher percentage of engraftment at day 14 following transplantation. Um, one of the other indications for which we receive a sample in the lab, uh, in addition to the protocol draws that are, that are performed, is when a patient looks like they're not engrafting at all. And so one of the things that is done is to give the patient a donor lymphocyte infusion from the same donor who, uh, from whom the first graft was obtained. Uh, usually the patient engrafts after receiving the DLI. And this is a prime example here. This is a CML patient who never, whose graft never did quite take in the first couple of months following transplantation. So this patient was given a DLI, and as you can see, following the DLI, the engraftment in all the various subsets went up pretty dramatically. Uh, but this is not to say that every cell subset behaves exactly the same way, or even that a subset obtained from different uh, compartments will behave exactly the same. Now this, this is a slide I got from Marco Milcarek, who is uh, very interested in lung run cells, which are the dendritic cells in the skin. And I'd like you to focus on, on this, this, this part of the slide where we're looking at just the DC cells, which are the dendritic cells. So these are patients that, again, were non-myeloablative conditioning, day 28 chimerism, looking at DCs in either blood, bone marrow, or in the skins. Um, and essentially what you see is that these patients engrafted perfectly in uh, the blood and the bone marrow as far as the DCs were concerned by day 28. However, if you look at their lung run cells, which is the dendritic cells in the skin, virtually a very, very few of them had engrafted at all. Most of them had barely any engraftment. So, um, so it's not proof that if you have engraftment in a particular subset in one compartment of the body that you'd have equivalent amounts of engraftment in other compartments. So, so that's another caveat that one has to keep in mind. So I'll go through a few complex cases that we have um, in the lab that, record, that necessitate a little more cogitating on our part and a little more tweaking when it comes to looking at the analysis. Um, the one that I just showed you previously, where I was 75% donor, that's one of the straightforward ones. Uh, but occasionally, they're not as straightforward. So this is one example. There was a patient that was diagnosed with AML, uh, received a first transplant, two umbilical cord blood units, both failed to engraft. So three months later, this individual is transplanted with another two additional cord blood units. Happily for this patient and for us, who are trying to follow this patient in the lab, um, he engrafted 100% in all lineages with one of the cord blood units from the second transplant and still is doing fine, greater than 400 days post-transplant. However, every time we do receive a sample in the lab, we have to look for informative peaks for all the donors. And just to show you uh, how hairy that can get, this is, this is what um, the allelic calls for each of the five individuals involved in this, in this particular case look like. So here you have the patient with all their allelic calls. You have all four donors with all of their allelic calls. And now we have to start looking for, for unique peaks, unique alleles that are not shared with anybody else that should be informative. But now they have to be informative in five directions if you had a mix of everything. Uh, so if you're only looking for uniqueness at all, there's plenty that's unique. And so there's all these loci that would show up. Unfortunately, if you look at all of these circles, you can see that none of them extend across all five individuals. If you wanted that, there's only a single locus that one could have used. Now this is a problem for us because we prefer not to use a single locus and I'll, I'll have another case for you shortly depicting why we prefer using more than one locus when it comes time to, to doing this engraftment analysis. 
Uh, fortunately for us, we were not restricted to this one locus because as I said, this patient did engraft with just a single donor. So it was a very simple matter actually to find informative loci here where you had, uh, because it was a single donor, single recipient pair, we're looking at multiple alleles, multiple loci that one could use and multiple alleles that were informative, um, allowing us to say that engraftment was essentially 100% with who the, the donor we designated donor for. Now here's an individual, most times when you give a patient a double cord transplant, one of the cords loses out and it's very early. It usually happens within a month or so. So it's not an issue after a month and you really are restricted to looking for informative alleles between just the recipient and the donor. Uh, rarely, but not unheard of, you will get mixes that extend farther out. In this case, this individual is, we're looking at the C3 subset, about 138 days post-transplant. So here are the profiles, the pre-transplant profile of the recipient, and then cord blood one and cord blood two. And then if we go start hunting for, for alleles that would be informative, um, in this case, we found three different loci that were indeed informative. And as you can see, there's this, this, since this individual was a three-way mix, there's, you, see, you see multiple gra uh, peaks coming up in, in the post-transplant profile. So if you look at the allelic uh, types that have been called by the program, you see that there's the three loci that I mentioned to you that are the ones that are informative. But as I said to you, we, do, we, like to restrict, we do not like to restrict ourselves to a minimum number of alleles. We try to loci, we try to extend the number of loci to the maximum number possible. So if we, um, if we made a few adjustments in our calculations and we um, adjusted for a few things, you can use a two, two additional loci, uh, which are not ideal, but can be used. And so using the information from all five loci, uh, we, could, we could determine that essentially this individual was a true three-way three, three mix, 30% host, 35% of each of the cord blood units. And then occasionally we have this occurring. This happens usually with pediatric patients that are suffering from ALL, uh, and about 10% of individuals that suffer from myeloid dysplasias. Uh, so it's not completely uncommon. What happens is that we, have, we observe this allelic dropout phenomenon. And I'll, and I'll show you what this looks like uh, when we're actually performing the analysis. So this was a patient that suffered from myelodysplastic syndrome, uh, received a transplant from an unrelated donor, um, and about 236 days post-transplant came in, was really sick. Um, a sample was sent to cytogenetics. As you can see, 50% of his metaphases displayed multiple abnormalities. Uh, and then here's a long laundry list of the abnormalities that were observed. Uh, there was a deletion in the, and for our purposes, the most important ones are the fact that there was a deletion in the long arm of chromosome 5, and then missing copies of chromosome 7 and 18. This essentially, this individual was diagnosed as having relapsed. So when the patient first came in um, and didn't, didn't have all of these problems, we had informative loci that we could use on chromosome 5 as well as on chromosome 18 that we were using in our routine analysis of this patient's post-transplant sample. And then this sample came in and this is what the profile started to look like. Now this is, this is one of the normal chromosomes, chromosome 21, which apparently has no problems associated with it. So here's the pre-transplant profile of this recipient. Here's the donor's profiles in nice heterozygous peaks that are well separated. And then you have the post-transplant profile. And as you can see, the majority of what you see is, is, is recipient derived. It's about 93% recipient, 7% contribution from the donor. But if you looked at something that was on chromosome 18, a locus that was on chromosome 18, which was, a very, which was one of the informative loci actually. So here's the pre-transplant recipient speaks. Here's the donor speaks. And then you look at the post-transplant recipient and all you really see is this peak. This allele is missing. And that's because they've lost that entire chromosome. And that's true also for the two loci that are on chromosome 5. So you can see pre-transplant there were two peaks and the donor has two nice peaks and then post-transplant again there's a missing allele. This is another, um, another one of the loci that sits on chromosome 5 and you see the exact same thing occurring. There's a missing allele, recipient allele. 
And this can be a problem, especially if you have donor alleles that are coincident with the recipient alleles. You can miss call the percentage of donor and recipient, uh, making it imperative that we constantly check to make sure that everything fits and everything actually, all the, all the results we get actually talk to each other. And there's consistency. Uh, so there are a lot of advantages to using microsatellites. Uh, one is that they are relatively easy to use. As I said, it's, it's kit-based right now. You just, it's a single PCR reaction. It's multiplexed. You add your DNA and off you go and then you run it. Um, the, major, the major problem, of course, is the analysis, which can be very cumbersome. Uh, it's pretty accurate. There are very high levels of accuracy. Uh, as I've already shown you, the amount of discrimination that you can achieve is amazing because of the high degrees of polymorphism at each of these loci, uh, where the repeat units can vary from 10 to 1,000. These commercial kits, of course, are more restricted in what they use. So you have between 20 to 100 repeats. Um, they're very informative because you have a large number of alleles with all of these markers. Um, most other systems don't have as many alleles because they're interrogating SNPs, which you can have only four possible combinations of. Uh, additional advantages is that you need very little amounts of DNA. Uh, and this is a huge advantage when you're looking at cell subsets because oftentimes you can get few nanograms of DNA out of an isolated cell subset. Um, and, and that allows us to, to still question what, what a percent of donor in a mix would be. Uh, the DNA can be degraded, it doesn't have to be intact, it can be only a few nu hundred nucleotides in length and will still be an effective template. Um, it's a multiplex reaction as I said, so you get uh, large numbers of copies of, of multiple um, DNA sequences that are amplified simultaneously. And finally you don't have to worry about contaminant DNA such as fungal and bacterial sources because they don't amplify. The PCR uh, primers are actually human specific, so you never have to worry about uh, maintaining sterility and uh, worrying about the source. Of course, it's not all advantages. There are some disadvantages, one of which is the fact that you do see plateau bias because you do not, it's not a quantitative method in that uh, you're not following them at every step of the PCR reaction. You, you have a certain set number of PCR reactions that you always perform. Uh, and so even if they, there might be some quantitative differences that can get blurred. Uh, so at best, these results are semi-quantitative. Um, sometimes you see preferential amplification because it is a multiplex, although they've tried, the manufacturer has done his best to, to ensure that um, all of the genes, are all, all of these loci are amplified equally efficiently. As you can imagine, in practice, that's not always the case. So there are some alleles that are amplified more robustly than others. Uh, you oftentimes get stutter artifacts, which then have to be accounted for in your calculations. Um, and finally, the analysis can be very cumbersome unless you set up macros to, to handle them for you. Okay, I'll now switch to the real-time PCR, which is this new technology that, as I said, is not yet on the market. It's being beta tested. And most of these slides, and virtually all of these slides, are from Celera because we don't have any data ourselves contribute to this. Um, but I'll just introduce you to the technology because like I said, it, it does hold some promise in certain areas of, of engraftment monitoring. So what this technology does is that it, it interrogates um, insertion deletion mutants, sorry, or markers. And these are bi-directional, of course, there's, just this, there's a plus and a minus in this. So it's not as powerful as STR. There's not the vast array of alleles that we have in STRs. It's a plus or it's a minus. You either have it or you don't. Um, there's about 34 markers that are on 20 chromosomes. And what you do is you set up, similar to the STRs, is you set up a screening test. You determine which markers would be informative. And then you move to your quantitation test, which is following transplantation, which is when you're actually going to be looking at the percent of donor or recipient, whichever you choose to follow. And you pick from among these markers the ones that are, that are informative in whichever direction you wanted them to be. And you quantitate the percentage of whatever your DNA, your minor component is in this mix, the sample that you've obtained. Uh, in terms of its power of discrimination, it's nowhere close to being as powerful as the STR. Um, now this is again information I got from the company where you, your chances of finding at least one locus that's informative in a mixture of two individuals 
in three different populations was looked at, either unrelated or individuals that were SIBs, and then your probability of finding at least two loci. And as I said, we are generally gun shy of using one locus for sure. When two makes us uncomfortable, we'd rather have more. And we have asked the company to give us information on what happens if you're looking at three loci and have never received that information, which leads me to believe that it's probably not very good. Uh, but the main reason for, for, this, for this not being so powerful is, is if you focus your attention on the African American population, um, to find just a single locus among SIBs that's informative, you're at best your chances are 97%. Now, all you're asking for is a single one. Um, if you're European or Japanese, your chances are better. But when you, when you start to uh, demand a little more of the system, and you say, no, I want two informative loci that I want to follow, you can see what happens to the African American group. Your chances of finding two SIBs that have at least two informative loci drops now to 88%. And I can imagine it drops even more dramatically if you start asking for three. So this, this is not, like, as I said, anywhere near as powerful. Um, at least if you're looking at related individuals. If you're looking at unrelated, it's not so bad because you, you're still at 99% probability of finding uh, loci that are informative. So this audience probably uh, is pretty well versed in what the TACMAN assay is. So I'll be very brief here. Essentially what it is is a PCR reaction uh, with specifically designed primers that flank a region that interrogates the, in the insertion deletion. Uh, and then there's a probe that recognizes the insertion or the deletion. And the probe has conjugated to it a fluorophore, a reporter fluorophore, and then a quencher dye, which because of its close proximity to the reporter dye on the probe, actually quenches it and does not allow fluorescence to occur. And, and so if you, if you just have the reaction just sitting in a tube, nothing is happening because there's no fluorescence <coughs> to be detected. If you, if you start the PCR reaction and your probe is actually not perfectly hybridized to your chromosomal DNA of interest because it does not recognize its cognate sequence, so it's kind of flying a little in the breeze, one might say. As the TAC polymerase comes along, uh, polymerizing in the 5 prime, 3, 3 prime direction, it sees this probe that's kind of floating around and just kicks it off. So when it kicks the probe off, the reporter as well as the quencher still remain in close proximity to each other, so there's no fluorescence. <clears throat> so unless the probe is recognized, is sitting flush on the DNA and is recognizing the sequence perfectly, is perfectly hybridized, uh, you do not get fluorescence at all. And the reasons why you get fluorescence at all is because as the PCR reaction proceeds, TAC polymerase proceeds along the <clears throat> the strand of DNA, sees the probe sitting here, sees it, it's perfectly hybridized, basically starts to digest it using its exonuclease activity. This digestion allows the reporter to now be separated from the quencher and allows this to fluoresce. And this fluorescence is then captured <clears throat> by an instrument. And the amount of signal is actually proportional to the amount of your input DNA, the amount of amplicon that was produced. Um, and this is what a standard curve would look like. And essentially what you're looking at is CT values or cycle thresholds, which is the cycle at which uh, the fluorescence crosses the background threshold. And in this case, the background would be this green line. So anything below this is considered back background fluorescence. If it crosses the green line, then it becomes fluorescence. That's, that's something that's real. And so here's a standard curve with different dilutions of a DNA sample. Uh, this being the most concentrated, so it crosses the threshold at the lowest cycle number. This being the least concentrated, so it's crossing the threshold at, at a cycle number of 32. And this can be plotted onto a, a graph where you have the CT values versus the log number of copies of your input DNA. And then if you had an unknown DNA sample that you ran, uh, you, could, you could see what, what its CT value was and then plot the CT value on this graph and determine what your, what your log number of copies of input DNA that you put into the reaction was, since it's directly proportional. And this is ex essentially uh, the, the logic that's used by uh, the manufacturer, the Celera program, in order to determine what the percentage of a minor population in your mix would be.
uh, as I said again, these are all from Solera. We haven't actually tested this out uh, to any great extent in the lab. Um, this is a this is a DNA that they call the JS DNA, and there's uh, triplicates of uh, different concentrations of this DNA, ranging all the way from 0.1 percent to 100 percent. Um, and the range is 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 1, 2, and 10 percent. As you can see, the triplicates are pretty tight in terms of when they cross the, the threshold. Their CT values are pretty tight. Um, the one nifty thing about what the company has manufactured is, is a program which is very, very user-friendly. So when you, when you set up your screening plate, um, and here you have, you have an example where you have two different DNAs. You have the C125, 448 and C12560, um, you ran them in these screening trays and then you hit a button essentially and the program runs this analysis for you and tells you exactly which markers were informative and in which direction. So you can see the ones that are in green were informative for C12548, the ones in purple were informative for C12560 uh, and then the ones that are non not informative or not determined. And then you can choose which ones of these you want to use in your subsequent analysis without having to actually pour over the graphs and like we do in the STRs. Um, this is again another uh, readout that we got from the company, slide from the company where they, they're looking at uh, input DNA based on their own calculations, two different markers that were used in the assay, and then um, what the program calculates for you as being the percentage of this minor component in the mix. Uh, as you can see, the two markers give you pretty close results and the results are very similar to what was calculated as being it should be there. And, and again, the nifty thing about this program is that it's, it's a click of a button. You, you run the program and you hit calculate and it basically does it for you and, and spits out the result, uh, which is very attractive since the STR analysis can be so cumbersome. Uh, so in terms of its, the advantage of this, of this new, these new system that's being advertised is that um, they say that you can detect down to 1 in 10,000 copies of a minor component. Now this is something we haven't tested out um, in the lab ourselves. Uh, but if you look at uh, what you need in order to generate this, this degree of sensitivity, um, you find that you need bucket loads of DNA actually. So if you use one nanogram of DNA, which is what we use currently um, in the STR assay, and sometimes all we can get with some of the subsets that we're working with, your sensitivity is, is about the same as what the STR gives you, 3 to 5%. If you want to achieve a sensitivity of 0.01%, the 1 in 10,000, you need to use 250 times as much DNA in the reaction. Um, it actually gets a little scarier than that, as I'll describe to you what, what the assay actually involves. Uh, and the reason for this is, of course, that you're trying to avoid stochastic error, uh, stochastic sampling error, and you and you want a minimum amount of DNA, 250 nanograms, uh, to be assured of a certain number of copies of whatever locus you are examining. Uh, one of the advantages, one of the other advantages of the system is the speed of analysis. As I said, it's the click of a button. And the program does it for you. Uh, and then the company advertises that you're able to detect a two-fold change. But I, in our hands, and I, and I admit this is a limited number of samples, um, this has been hit or miss. We haven't exactly been able to, to do this, to demonstrate, uh, to detect a two-fold change at these lower levels of a minor component. So in terms of disadvantages, there's, there's a huge number of disadvantages to this, to this system. Uh, one is that the initial setup is extremely cumbersome and time consuming compared to the STRs, which is single tube, PCR reaction, and off you go. Uh, there's cherry picking of primers and probes required because they don't sell them as, as a kit, or they sell them as, as individual uh, tubes, and you have to actually pick what it is that you're going to, to interrogate and maintain a profile on each donor recipient combination and go back to different tubes constantly. So there's plenty of room for error, as you can imagine, especially um, in a lab the size of ours that handles as much um, testing as we do in the chimerism, in the chimerism area. The sensitivity was, is entirely dependent on the concentration of input DNA. And this could be really hairy if you're trying to look at sorted cells, where sometimes all we get is one or two nanograms of DNA. Uh, 
the current software design is very limited. They've designed it so that it can only handle one donor recipient combination. So if you had two umbilical cord blood, cord blood units or sequential transplants, the program couldn't handle them. Uh, the panel is restricted as I've just shown you. It's not as informative. It's discrimination is, is nowhere near as powerful. It's very heavily racial group dependent as well. Um, the, uh, the other thing is that you have to run a calibrator, which is the pre-transplant recipient or a donor sample every single time you run this assay. So as you can imagine, you risk running out of DNA very quickly. Uh, there's also um, problems with the fact that you wouldn't recognize loss of heterozygosity, especially if you're restricted to using just one or two alleles. And if those are the ones that are lost, um, you, would, you would erroneously call your results and miscall percent donor or recipient. Um, contamination, much as we would not like it to happen, does happen, even though it is fairly rare. But the STRs, it's very easily detectable simply because you're looking at so many different loci. With this, if you're only looking at one or two informative loci, there's no way you'd, you'd pick up a contaminant, especially if it happened to be of the same flavor as what you're working with. Uh, and finally, the workload would need multiple runs because all the assays are run in triplicate. You run a control with each of them. You run a calibrator with each assay. And if you're using, if you're looking at multiple subsets, which is what we do in the lab for each donor recipient pair, um, then you're looking at a truckload of work. So it's, it's somewhat, it's not nowhere near as high throughput at the front end as, as the STR assay. So given all of this, is there a place for this new technology in engraftment analysis? I believe there is, um, but in very restricted settings. So here are a few things that I could come up with in terms of where could we use this, this assay. One is if you're only looking at a single donor recipient pair and you're not restricted in terms of you know, how much DNA you had pre-transplant from the recipient or from the donor and could just run this over and over again, you'd be fine. Uh, if there's an instance where you want to look at very, very low levels of donor chimerism, right now we can't give you better than 2 to 5 percent. But with this assay, we could give you 1 in 10,000, supposedly, once we test it out and make sure of it. Um, you could use it in situations such as solid organ transplantation, for example, where access to uh, white blood cells from a recipient is not a problem. Uh, such as in liver patients, which oftentimes are referred to as with chronic GVHD. Um, using the standard chimerism testing, we can't often detect chimerism, but this would allow us to detect chimerism for those patients. Uh, or if you wanted to look at a combined BMT kidney transplant, which is currently being set up both at the UW in collaboration between the UW and the, and the Hutch, uh, these, are, these are patients that could easily be followed for, uh, for low levels of chimerism. Uh, if you're looking at skits patients, again, because you're looking at a single donor recipient pair. Um, if you wanted to look at minimal residual disease studies, if you did not have a molecular marker that you could follow very easily, this could be something one could use to follow minimal residual, residual disease. Um, you, you could address the question of tolerance induction. Why do some patients reject a graft, a solid organ graft, and others not? It could be that there's a certain threshold of chimerism that you do need. Uh, and we've never been able to test for that simply because that threshold is lower than our 2 to 5 percent that we've been able to investigate up until now. And finally, any others that anybody could think of. So I thank you for your attention, and I'll take any questions. Well, thank you, Dr. Pura, for a very informative talk. Are there thank questions you. from the audience? So, so I just had a question. I mean, you, you mentioned that the STR assay is you know, semi-quantitative. Yeah, I swear I've seen people in talks at meetings saying that they're actually, people are using it to quantify fibers. I mean, can, can it be used really to quantify fibers? Well, we do quantify it, right? We do give you results. But it could well be, you know, not all of them suffer from this plateau bias, of course, depending on the input DNA. If you, if you put in a lot more DNA, if you put in far less DNA for an individual, you might not suffer from the plateau bias because you could still be on the log phase when you hit your, your end of your 30 cycles. Uh, whereas for other individuals where you've used, you know, maybe a little more DNA, you've, you've achieved plateau for, for one faster than the other. So, so it, is, it is at best semi-quantitative because we can't, we can't be assured that for every single one 
We're catching them at the log phase. I have a question. Sure. There's been interest in microchimerism, uh, partly interest in autoimmune diseases, but also recognition that mothers pass cells to and fro their, their right. fetuses. Right. Is this level of sensitivity that can be achieved potentially going to be confusing? Is, is it a donor or is it a microchimeric? Uh, previous pregnancy, for example, is that's, it that level of sensitivity? That's a very good question, and actually it is. So that, that's something that one would want to, to investigate in a, in a few normals, so-called <coughs> normals. Uh, also multiprous women, mm -hmm. you'd want to look at multiprous women. Um, you'd want to look at individuals that had received a transplant, let's say a solid organ transplant, um, and had then had an nephrectomy. So there should technically not be anything left behind. Mm -hmm. So these would be samples one would want to test mm -hmm. prior to uh, making, yeah, it could be that that kind of interference would definitely call any result into question. Mm -hmm. You're right. Other questions? It, it seems to me that if you, if you were to, before running the STRSA, um, for each patient, I realize you'd have to run a few extra samples, but basically you should be able to construct a standard curve for each patient given their donor and recipient stuff beforehand. So run the donor alone, the recipient alone, then run 5% donor, 10% donor, 50% donor. So make a standard curve for each patient. And then if you input the same amount of DNA every time, which mm -hmm. you should be able to control how much DNA you're putting in, you should at least be able to know in that particular case whether or not you can differentiate 5 and 10% or not. You're talking about the standard STR? Yeah, the standard STR one. You can should... easily differentiate between 5 and 10%. So we can't go down below. Our sensitivity level peaks out at about 3%. So, so in answer to Dr. Sabo's question, it is actually, you're saying, quantitative then? It yeah. is quantitative. But you're, saying, but you're saying you have to be absolutely sure that you're, that you're accurate in terms of your input DNA based on what? How would, you, how would you ensure that? That your input DNA every time is exactly what, it's, what you're advertising it to? We do quantitate it, but sometimes with cell subsets, we do not. Because it's too little. There's nothing there. The, the, the spectrophotometer can't read it. So we just assume that there's something in there and throw it into the assay. And more often than not, we'll get a result. It seems like the one situation where none of these technologies would work would be engraftment from an identical twin. Are there any tricks to monitoring chimerism from an identical twin? No. If you find any, you'll have to let me know. Because <laughs> they are identical. There's nothing that separates There's the two. Genetic change you could follow, like methylation. Now. You would have to go look for it. And that would be so individual because it would be completely environmentally dependent. Just one, one Can you do megakaryocytes? Can we do megakaryocytes? You look for engraftments in thrombocyte, thrombocyte lineage to see if so. Is there any role for Early, that very early. If someone is having troubles in grafting and they have persistent thrombocytopenia after their transplant, is there any utility to, to trying to do this technique to look at their megakaryocytes to see if they've engrafted? Sure, there's utility. I think the problem is markers. You know, finding a pretty specific marker that's completely specific and how early, uh, how early. I mean, you'd, you'd have to look at a very early <coughs> progenitor. Dan? <laughs> They're so large so to get. Large. Yeah. Yeah. Very yeah. difficult to get the fragile, fragile, yeah. fragile yeah. large, yeah. different yeah. amounts of DNA. Rare, yeah. ones rare. It's, it's, it's going to be there. Well, our hour is up, and the people are still talking. Right. So it must have been a great okay. talk. Thanks oh, very thank much. Thank you. <laughs>